Thomas the Apostle is mentioned four times in Scripture by name. He's mentioned among the list of the Apostles when he gives us uh, both Matthew and Luke and Mark give us the list of the Twelve Apostles. We have his name there. And then he's mentioned three times in John's Gospel. So he's pretty much an important figure among the Twelve. Like the other Twelve, he was called by our Lord to be an Apostle, chosen from the many who were following to be among the intimate Twelve. Among the Twelve, there was the truly intimate three of Peter, James, and John, but then there was the Twelve who were with him all the time. Now, Thomas being called, we don't know what his profession was before him. Scripture does not tell us what his profession was before he became an apostle, nor do we know in the exact nature of his call of how it happened. Right? We have uh, uh, Peter's call, we have John's, we have Andrew's, we have James's, we have uh, Philip's and Nathaniel's, and we have Matthew's. But we don't have the rest. Somewhere along the line, Jesus walked up to this guy named Did Thomas, or Didymus, the twin, and said, follow me. And he did. Like the rest of the apostles, he gave up everything to follow the Lord. Like the rest of them, he left home and so forth to be a disciple. And like the rest of them, he witnessed these incredible things that our Lord did. He was there when our Lord came walking on the boat on the water. He was there when our Lord calmed the storm. He was in the boat and he watched this great thing take place where the Lord said, Be still, and everything was still. He saw our Lord drive out demons and do all kinds of powerful miracles, displaying the fact that he had power over nature, power over human sickness, power over death, power over demons, and so forth, that he truly was God. He was proving it, and, Pete, and um, Thomas was witnessing it. Right? Thomas was also given the authority, like the apostles, to go forth and to preach. During our Lord's public ministry, when he sends the twelve out in twos, Thomas goes out. I don't know who he was with, but he was with one of them anyway. Thomas had somebody to a companion to be with him along the way as his companion. And they went about preaching in the name of Jesus, and Thomas was working miracles, right? In the name of Jesus, he was driving out demons. In the name of Jesus, he was healing people. And so Thomas witnessed the power, not just in Jesus himself, but in his name, the authority of his name. And in the name of our Lord, he was doing great and powerful things. And so it's no wonder that Thomas would have been really contemplating the mystery of this person whom he was traveling with for three years. You know, Thomas was there when our Lord said, distribute the bread and the fish to the crowd of 5,000. And Thomas is looking at a basket that only has two fish and a couple loaves of bread. And next thing you know, his basket is full, and then full, and refilled, and filled, and refilled, and so forth. And he's among the men who are taking baskets that are empty, and then pouring out bread and fish to the people, as if it was kept refilling. He, he, was, he was there watching all this, right? So we see in Thomas this really uh, a person traveling with our Lord who had to constantly, day by day, contemplate the mystery of who it was, that he was daily encountering and living with. God made man. Right? And then if we look at John's Gospel, that last week of our Lord's life, particularly from chapter 7 to chapter 10, there's a lot of controversy going on in those chapters. These are the conversations our Lord is having with the Pharisees, particularly regarding his own divinity. Right? In chapter 7, they're going through, the Lord's speaking to them over and over again, and... Um, he talks about how uh, he is from the Father, and the Father sent him, right? And by verse 29, in that conversation with the apostles, the Pharisees try to arrest our Lord. Right? Thomas is witnessing this controversy. Here Jesus is proudly proclaiming the fact that he is from the Father, sent from the Father to them, and then they're trying to arrest him. He's caught in the middle of the fact that Jesus is proclaiming his divinity, the Pharisees are rejecting it, and yet he himself has witnessed the power of the Lord's divinity, right? And then we have in 49, they want, chapter 7, first verse, they want to arrest him again. And yet our Lord is able to slip through their midst. In chapter 8, again, he's in conversation with the Pharisees, right? Um, and uh, Jesus says to them, I know that you're sons of Abraham, yet you're trying to kill me. <laughs> the Lord tells them straight out, you're trying to kill me, right? 
And the pharaohs are, we're not trying to kill you. Uh, yeah, you are. <laughs> Everyone knows you are, and you are, right? Jesus calls them out on it. And then Jesus goes on to say, before Abraham came to be, I am. He uses the name of God for himself. He basically just said, I am the one who spoke to Moses in the burning bush. I am the one who let you out of Egypt. I am the one who brought you to the Holy Land. I am the one you offer sacrifice to in the temple. Me, I am. I am. And so again, they pick up stones to throw at him. Why? Because the proclamation of his divinity, the proclamation. And Thomas is hearing this. This is very important for Thomas. Be hearing these proclamations of our Lord and then the response of the Pharisees, right? Jesus will go on in chapter 8. Oh, no, it was chapter 8. So chapter 9 is all about blind Bartimaeus. <laughs> not, blind Bart not, not Bartimaeus, the other young man who was blind in the temple in that controversy. And we get to chapter 10, uh, where Jesus says just straight out, I and the Father are Again, the proclamation of divinity and the response, they picked up rocks to stone him. And they said, we are stoning you not for good work, but for blasphemy. You, a man, are making yourself God. Jesus made it very clear who he was. And Thomas is witnessing this. He's witnessing Jesus' proclamation of who he really is, the response of the Pharisees. You have to imagine, maybe he was caught, I don't know. Maybe all the apostles were. Maybe everyone was kind of caught between the leaders of their religion and how they're responding to Christ Jesus' proclamation of the divinity. There had to be a real struggle there in the midst of this. Like, okay, Thomas must have been like, okay, I see you working all these miracles. I hear your proclamation that you are God. But then the religions of my religion, the leaders of my religion are rejecting you. <laughs> That's a bit of a struggle there, right? However, he stays true to our Lord. Thomas has great faith. This is something that doesn't really get talked about much at all because everyone goes to, oh, doubting Thomas. Like, the other apostles weren't doubting, right? He wasn't a doubter, except at the end of the, at one spot, he gets a little bit of struggle there, right? Because when uh, it's time to go raise Lazarus from the dead, right, chapter 11, the apostles say, well, they were just trying to kill you. Why are you going back over that way? And uh, he talks about that. The Lord says what, he's going to, what he says. And Thomas responds with, let us go and die with him. Let us go and die with him. So Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. The Pharisee who has spent three chapters of John's gospel seeking to kill him. Jesus leaves because they were trying to kill him. Now he's going back to where they're trying to kill him. And the apostles, kind of, Lord, they were just trying to kill you. And Thomas says, let us go and die with him. Thomas does have faith in our Lord. He does believe in our Lord. And he's willing to die with our Lord. Early on. He's going with our Lord because he knows that our Lord is probably going to die and he's going to die with him. And I think that's important when we're talking about Thomas because... It says something about his character. It says something about his person. It says something about his love for the Lord. It says a lot about his faith. Right? That he wasn't just doubting Thomas who doubted the resurrection. There's something more to Thomas than just the doubt that he had at the end. Right? Because Thomas knew our Lord for those three years, walked with our Lord for those three years, watched our Lord for those three years, worked in the name of our Lord during those three years, listened to the conversations of our Lord between, between our Lord and the Pharisees, heard the proclamations of Jesus being the Son of God, saw the response of the Pharisees, and then was willing to die with him. He obviously had strong faith in the Lord when he said, let us go and die with him. Of course, our Lord is not killed as yet, right? He raises Lazarus from the dead. And as he's having dinner at Lazarus' house, the Pharisees are plotting to kill our Lord, and they also want to kill Lazarus. The guy just got back from the dead. Give him at least the dead. But anyway, they're, they're just, you know, plotting to kill Jesus and Lazarus, you know? And then comes the Last Supper. And then the conversation of the Last Supper. Jesus washes their feet, and they're... Now Jesus begins his longest conversation we have, recorded conversation we have with the apostles. 
begins in chapter 13 and ends in chapter 16 of John's Gospel. And here, during this conversation, our Lord is speaking about going away. Right? And, and Thomas obviously wants to be with our Lord. He was willing to die with him. He doesn't want to be parted from our Lord. And so Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Right? It's a good question for him to ask. Right? Although it's talking about him going away, but they know the way. And so forth, and Thomas is like, we don't know where you go. We don't know the way. Like, he's not yet grasping the fact that our Lord is speaking about his death and resurrection and so forth. And it's Thomas who elicits from our Lord one of the most famous sayings we hear about our Lord. When he speaks about himself, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He gives us that statement about himself in response to Thomas's question. Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. How beautiful that it was Thomas's question that drew out from our Lord this proclamation of his divinity. Right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way to the Father. He is the true life given to us by the Father. And he is truth itself. Now, like the other apostles. Thomas gets scared. Right? He's in the garden like the others, he falls asleep. Right? Our Lord is going through his suffering, his agony in the garden. Jesus is arrested and like the others, he gets afraid and he runs. Right? Peter and John follow our Lord from a distance and so forth and they kind of are there watching things happen during the time of the trial. Peter runs off completely but after he denies knowing our Lord three times, but Thomas got afraid, and he left. He was gone, perhaps, for a week. We don't know. He wasn't there at the upper room, and according to John's Gospel, um, the next time he's basically around again for the apostles to say something to him uh, is, is after the resurrection. Maybe it's just maybe just four days. It was after our Lord left anyway. After they had to know with our Lord, our Lord left them. <laughs> and then he comes back, and then he's they tell him that the Lord is risen, and he won't believe them. Now, this is where he gets the whole phrase doubting Thomas, because he says, Unless I see the marks in his hands and put my fingers in those marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe, right? So they take it like everyone takes poor Thomas to task for that. Did any of the apostles believe when Mary Magdalene came and told them? No. Did the apostles believe when the other women came and told them this was the Lord? No. Did Peter believe after he went into the tomb himself? No. John says he did, right? After telling us he read faster than Peter, he tells us that he believed. But Peter was incredulous until our Lord personally appeared to Peter. And poor Thomas gets the reputation as doubting Thomas. They were all doubting. Just because Thomas didn't believe the other ten doesn't mean that he was any worse than off than the rest of them. Right? Now, he should have believed them. However, Thomas maybe thought they were playing a joke on him. I don't know. For some reason, he wouldn't even believe what they had to say. There was a struggle that he had there, that moment. Right? They all had that struggle. And here was Thomas with that struggle. Right? And he says those words. Let's put my finger into the nails in his hands, put my hand into his side. And it's important that we have this. It's important for Thomas to doubt. That sounds strange to say. But it is important for our faith in the belief in the resurrection from the dead. Because when Jesus appears the second time to them a week later, and he says those beautiful words, peace be with you, the first time he proved that he was physically risen, he had some fish sandwiches with the apostles, right? They gave him bread and fish to eat. This time, he says to Thomas, put your finger in the nail marks in my hands and put your hand in my side. Right? Peter's, I'm sorry, Thomas's action of putting his finger into the nail marks in our Lord's hands give testimony to the fact that he rose physically with his body. The fact that Thomas could put his finger into our Lord's nail marks is proof that our Lord rose physically from the dead. Without Thomas having done that, we would not have had that. Thanks be to God, Thomas doubted, because Thomas's doubt led to our greater faith, knowing that Thomas actually took his finger and put it into the nail marks in our Lord's hands, and took his hand and put it into the side of our Lord. Thanks be to God, Thomas doubted. 
Because in Thomas's doubt, Thomas gives us the proof of the physical resurrection from the dead. And let me tell you today, that's pretty important. There are these foolish theologians out there, I mentioned the other day, these vague, malicious theologians saying, well, he, he, he rose from the dead is in a kind of a spiritual, substantial way, substantial way, not really physically. Well, I had this one priest tell me, if they found the body of Jesus, I'd still believe in the resurrection from the dead. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, you realize that's stupid, right? <laughs> this quote-unquote theologian, this priest says this to me. This was years ago. I think he's long since dead, this priest. God rest his soul. I'm sure he believes in the resurrection now. But <laughs> that doubt that was there that this man had obviously was discrediting the scripture of the fact that Thomas put his finger into the nail marks in the hands of our Lord, and he put his hand into the side of our Lord. Into his side. Now, there's another important part of this. Thomas's doubt allows us to understand the fact that our Lord's wounds were not going to heal. The wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side were to remain forever for us as a covenant cut in the flesh of Christ himself. God gave to Abraham the covenant of, that was sealed with the cutting of the covenant in circumcision. Our Lord himself now ends that covenant, begins the new covenant, and this covenant is cut in his flesh. It's cut in the very body of Christ. It's cut in the body of the second person of the most blessed trinity. And the wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side are not going to heal. The crown of thorn marks, gone. Whip marks, gone. The bruising, gone. The wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side will remain forever as a testimony to his love for us. Forever he stands before the God and Father of heaven, bearing his wounds, interceding for us. And then he shows us his wound, reminding us of his covenant of love and mercy. So that we can have trust in the wounds of Christ. We can have trust in the mercy of God. We can have trust in the fact that he has loved us unto death and forever he has branded himself and cut a covenant in his flesh of wounds that will not heal. And so beautifully, Thomas's doubt leads to our deeper faith. Thanks be to God, we had Thomas take his hand and put it into the side of Christ. That beautiful side of Christ, which flowed, from which flowed blood and water, love and mercy. Symbolic also the sacraments of the Eucharist and the sacrament of holy baptism. It's through that wound in our Lord's side that we enter into the intimacy of the heart of God. Now, Thomas does this. Again, I think this is an incredible moment for Thomas. Here he is. He spent three years following our Lord. He saw all the great workings of our Lord. He heard the Pharisees and Jesus going back and forth about him, Jesus' divinity and so forth. And, and, and all of a sudden, there he is. And all the doubt, all the fear, all this stuff just brought together. I'm sure at that moment, everything must have just reached the high point for Thomas. And he drops to his knees and he says, my Lord and my God. Doubting Thomas was the first one to call Jesus directly God. They called him Lord. They called him the Son of God and so forth. There was, we could say, some maybe perhaps obscure language for some of us, whatever. That, but Thomas was clear. My Lord and my God. He straight out calls him God. Not Son of God, not Savior, not Messiah. He doesn't call him the Son of Man. He doesn't call him the one who has chosen and so forth. He calls him straight out God. And he worships him as God. He comes to that perfection of faith and belief of who Jesus is. And then our Lord says, you know, um, you have believed because you have seen me, Thomas. <laughs> Which he did. Blessed are those who have not seen me and believe. So we're blessed because we have not seen him, yet we believe. Right? So we are more blessed. But thanks be to God because Thomas's disbelief leads us to greater belief. What will Thomas do with all this? 
like the other apostles after receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, he will go forth and proclaim Jesus Christ. A friend of mine, her great, 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 great grandfather going back to the first century was a Brahmin uh, sitting by the waters in India when some man came up to them and asked them to listen. They refused to listen to him. And so he threw water up in the air, commanded in the name of Jesus to stay there, and the water stayed suspended in the air. He began to preach to them and baptized him. Our great, great, great grandfather, that man was apostle, the apostle Thomas. Thomas went forth to India and preached the gospel. The whole diocese area, Kerala, the whole southern India is Catholic and very Catholic because of Thomas. To this day, they still celebrate the liturgy as Thomas gave it to them. A lot of controversy on that today, right now, liturgically. But that's another story. <laughs> because the, the Indian people are clinging to the, to the liturgy that Thomas himself gave them. Right? And Thomas fulfilled what he said he would do. Let us go and die with him. Thomas did. He died for our Lord. He died proclaiming our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave his life for him. So much did Thomas believe that Jesus was not simply Lord, <laughs> but he was Lord and God. Lord and God. Today we give great thanks to God for a gift of such a powerful apostle as Thomas. A great and incredible man who offered his life to the Lord by following him, gave himself to the Lord in serving the Lord in those three years, who listened to our Lord, who came to such faith in our Lord that even after struggling through his doubt, proclaimed, My Lord and my God. May we be given the gift of faith that Thomas was given, that faith that just wants to be with our Lord, who just wants no more than to know the way, the truth, and the life. That we may be given the gift of true faith in he who is the way, the truth, and the life, our Lord and our God. May God bless you.